tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Part 1. The Letter The cruelest gift in the world, I think, is the distinctly human ability to partly comprehend one's own consciousness. We are all aware of our own individual sentience, but without the slightest idea as to why. I believe that this awareness was an evolutionary mistake, a natural but inherently unnatural phenomenon. In the pursuit of understanding the only thing that will become clear is the absolute absurdity of this existence. Is there even any reason to pursue rational understanding in an obviously irrational universe? In any case, I've deduced that this must be why suicide and religion become such popular answers amongst lost souls. Is it possible to simply live a life of ignorance in which these questions don't keep you awake until the sun rises? Or do we all live plagued by questions to which no man can ever know the answers? Perhaps death will grant answers, or perhaps death will grant you the void in which you will cease to be. The void is a concept that can't be comprehended. One can't even begin to understand what real, genuine nothingness would be like. It's impossible. The strongest fear is the fear of the unknown, as is only logical, so suicide isn't an answer I was willing to accept, to take the plunge into darkness without any idea of what lay on the other side was nonsensical. I had to know what lay beyond. Ironically, this obsession gave my previously meaningless life some resemblance of meaning, a self-assigned goal that presented the necessary motivation to continue, and so I clung to it. The argument of what constituted a truly valuable life was often a topic of debate between a colleague of mine, Thomas Dalton, and I. We were both professors, he of mathematics, myself of ancient history at the University of Dartmouth, England. I think I would have even considered him a friend at times. He believed, as fanciful as it sounds, that love was the key to a happy life. But to agree would be to admit that value and happiness were one and the same, which I simply do not believe to be true. A man can lead a truly valuable life, full of success. He can leave a legacy that permanently marks his name in the history books, yet he can never know happiness. A man who pursues both love and happiness can live a normal life with a loving family, but may never know his true potential. He may lay on his deathbed, filled with anxiety and regret, wishing for a little longer. However, as much as Thomas and I disagreed, we agreed ultimately that in the end, the man who achieves both love and value would be a truly great man who lived his life to its fullest. However, this man would, no doubt, had the weight of the world on his shoulders, as all great men do, and I wonder if this man would have nights where he himself wished for a simpler life, a man who truly lived, yet wishing he hadn't. That's ultimately the burden of being human. No matter the path you take, the answers you find are never concrete. The knowledge of a discovery was brought to my attention in the early months of 1919. I arrived at work early one morning to find a letter on my desk. Upon reading it, I was overwhelmed with an unmistakable sense of dread. It was from a man in Egypt. He described a tomb unlike the others that had been previously discovered. Peculiar hieroglyphs had, by all accounts, been painstakingly etched into the stone above an opening in one of their archaeological dig sites. The symbols were utterly unique. The writer seemed to have attempted a crude sketch of one of the symbols, but either this was the discovery of an entirely new hieroglyph, or the man contacting me had gone completely mad. The symbol did resonate with me for reasons unclear to myself at the time. The letter asked for my assistance. After spending so much time, my time behind a desk, I was no doubt intrigued, even a little excited, to get back into the field. My curiosity had gotten the better of my rising fear and uncertainty. The letter wasn't signed, however. 
he had left enough details for me to investigate further. I like to believe that I was a man of fact and science. However, I cannot deny that I am often optimistic. I like to believe that there is an order to this chaos. This letter, falling into my lap with the information it contained, was too intriguing to have been completely random. Too big to be a consequence of the irrational universe and all its absurdity. This letter, I thought, must mean something. Perhaps it was an invitation for me to uncover the value I so craved in my life. I was a fool to have let myself believe something so hopeful. I brought the letter to Thomas's attention. He seemed less enthusiastic than I had hoped. However, I could tell he was curious. I knew that Thomas was miserable at work. Our conversations were the highlight of his days. And, if I'm being honest, they were the highlight of mine as well. Thomas's unhappiness would be the key to encouraging him. A week or two in Egypt, a, a small change to the daily routine, I knew he'd want it. I just had to wait for him to come around to the idea. It took less than a week for Thomas to admit he wanted to come to Egypt. I was completely prepared to go alone, however, I simply felt more confident with Thomas at my side. In the days while Thomas was deciding, I will admit I grew further apprehensive about the idea, but I was sure that this was something big. The letter mentioned that the find was deep in the western desert. A map had been scratched into the back of the letter with a pen that was clearly running out of ink. This map was so crudely drawn that it really wasn't much help. Thomas was confident that we could ask Guy to read the map once in Egypt. I wasn't overly enthusiastic about going without further preparation, but I was battling an inner conflict of curiosity and uncertainty, a battle which my curiosity had long since won. If I'm being honest, I knew I was going to Egypt the moment I read the letter. It's as if I was being pulled towards it, and only in fleeting moments of clarity would I realize that what I was doing was condemning. In these moments, I would be filled with fear, but they were just that, fleeting moments. Thomas and I boarded the HMS Hannibal less than a month later, a Royal Navy vessel that was temporarily docked in Devonport for repairs bound for Alexandria. Thomas offered the captain a ludicrous amount of money in order for us to be granted passage to Egypt, with the added bonus of keeping our mission off the record. Much of our journey was spent in silence. My time aboard the vessel was mostly spent in deep thought. I felt a fear building within me that I couldn't shake. As I watched the sea with each passing day I became entranced by the darkness beneath the surface. Its depth seemed to have no end. At night, I had dreams of creatures beneath the waves. Dreams of creatures with soft grey skin, luminescent figures that spoke to me from the dark, yet I could never understand them. I know now that they weren't dreams, but confirmation that we were heading in the right direction. Part 2. Egypt Alexandria was distinctly otherworldly. Once within the busy streets, I couldn't help but feel like an invader. The air was thick and hard to breathe, and the heat of the midday sun bared down on us without mercy. Even outside, I felt claustrophobic. The air around us felt as if it had a physical weight that grew heavier and harder to bear the longer we remained outside. Egypt at this time had begun a currently ongoing revolution against British occupation, with rising political tension amongst the locals, I held my breath after every sentence I uttered, in anticipation of their reaction to my unquestioningly southern English accent. Thomas wasted no time in finding a guide willing to take us out into the desert. He made contact with a local who, upon examining the map on the letter, laid the letter under a more detailed map of the western desert and transferred the information he could, leading the way to our undoing. We were only in Alexandria very briefly. No one wanted to remain there for longer than was completely necessary. Even our guide seemed to be pleased to be leaving. Our guide was a very short man. He wore a long, loose-fitting robe that covered his sandals and a black headscarf, through which only his eyes were visible. The man's eyes were rather peculiar. 
The skin around them appeared gray. His eyes were unnaturally dark, yet appeared to emit a dim glow. I tried not to stare, as I didn't want to upset the man. Looking into them for too long also made my stomach turn. He barely uttered a single word during our time with him. It's still not clear to me whether he even knew a word of English, although of course it wasn't expected of him. It was clear he had no interest in making friends. I was beginning to worry that Thomas had become obsessed with this mission, however. I couldn't deny the progress we were making. Against better judgment, I was not about to go home now. The three of us set off immediately on camelback. Thomas nor I knew how to ride. However, the stranger rode ahead and led the way, pulling us along with rope, attaching us together in a line. A rope tied to the stranger's saddle led to a ring in the nose on my camel. Another rope from my saddle led back to Thomas. I felt a strange sense of discomfort at the thought of these creatures being pulled along by a metal ring that had been forced through their noses. They existed simply to be pulled around and serve their human masters. However, this may be the view of a man who didn't grow up around animals, a sheltered view. I doubt a camel is capable of putting much thought into its situation, nor do I imagine they care much, as long as they are fed. To live with a simple mind, to lack the awareness to comprehend one's own predicament, may at the end of it all be a real blessing. I do often envy the ignorant, but when you wholeheartedly believe a lie, you can live an uncompromised life in which you simply chase what feels good. Once you begin to seek the truth, seek answers, and begin questioning, you will find yourself lost. However, I also believe that the ignorant will come face to face with the path they chose once on their deathbed. The moment they realize that their life will come to an end, they will start to question it all perhaps wish for more time. It's funny, isn't it? How the human mind is simultaneously the most incredible gift and yet the greatest burden in the known universe. In comparison to all other known life, humans seem alien. Perhaps other intelligent life prospered on other worlds, perhaps even more intelligent than us. If they were to make contact with us all, I wonder how the average man would react. Perhaps extraterrestrial life would be seen as God. After all, if a life form more advanced made contact, if they had the power to wipe our world from the universe, would that not make them God? In the same way, humans are gods to all animals on this planet. Alien life to me only further disproves God. It would prove that life, if the conditions are right, can naturally appear in any environment. Life, even intelligent life like humans, is an entirely natural phenomenon. However, admitting that would be admitting just how irrelevant we are as individuals. Thomas and I often discussed religion. We passed our three-day camel journey by doing just that. The stranger never contributed. The stranger never contributed, but I could tell he was always listening intently. Whether he understood or not is still unclear. However, it doesn't really matter. Thomas and I came off and came back to the same conclusion, that religion is part of any early society for the purpose of keeping order and giving the average man a moral compass. There are many religions in the world, many older than Christianity. All human societies seem to come up with a religion of their own. Years ago, there would be no better way to ensure that a man didn't just do as he liked, unless, of course, he thought in doing so, he'd be signing his name for eternal suffering. Heaven and hell are concepts most religions come up with. Even reincarnation relies on a karma system. In my mind, if the only thing keeping a man decent is the prospect of divine reward, is he at his core really a good man? Religion undoubtedly gives people's lives meaning. If you believe that your life or soul is special, that would certainly give even the simple merchant a sense of pride. I can't blame people for turning to religion, for believing in a god or gods. I also can't blame the people who came up with the concepts and stories. 
If I were to rule the nation, I'd introduce religion myself, despite not believing. It brings people together. Religion is the best way to ensure the start of a healthy nation. It also helps explain the otherwise inexplicable, keeps the everyday man out of his own head. As we learn more about the world, make more discoveries, continue to advance, more and more religions make less and less sense, which is why I simply cannot believe, despite the comfort it would bring. Perhaps the key to happiness is to forgo analyzing life, a focus on the day-to-day. -day. However, I don't intend to be happy. I never intended to be happy. I intend to make sense of it. Thomas was always more agnostic. He believed that a god may exist, but that the life form above us would be nothing like anyone can imagine. I think he only believed that as some sort of backup plan. I think he lied to himself so that in his final days his soul may still be saved for his little faith. Most religions seem to suggest that to completely disregard the ideas they put forward is to condemn yourself to whatever version of hell they've come up with. I never shared Thomas's fear of the afterlife, for I never believed in the concept of a soul, unlike my colleague. I am not ignorant to the fact that religion has been the spark of many wars, and will likely continue to be. With technology advancing, the more we connect, the more different cultures learn about each other, the more we have to disagree on. I find it quite amusing, however, equally disappointing that people continue to kill one another over fantasies or silly political disputes. I once wondered if technology might prove to be the end of our species. It would make sense to me that the more advancements we make, the more dangerous we become to ourselves, as made evident by the merciless death machines used at the Somme. How disappointing it would be if our species came to an end at the hand of religious opinions or the greed of our leaders. The sun during the day was unbearable, yet the night brought with it a biting cold that forced me to breathe through short, sharp breaths. I really did feel as if I shouldn't have been there, as if even my surroundings were begging me to go home. With each day we got closer, I felt panic building in my chest. Each evening we set up the campsite, lit a fire, ate dinner, then I'd scramble into my tent, anxiety slowly building within me until I fell into the security of sleep. During the first night, I found myself wishing I didn't wake up the next morning. A primal fear was building within me. However, the sun would rise, the stranger would wake, and we'd pack up and set off again. I started to firmly believe that we should turn around and leave, however. I felt a pull that I couldn't shake. Every time I tried to confide in Thomas about my fear, my tongue would lock up, and no words would escape me. During the final night, I lay in my tent and found myself pulling at my hair. I felt my chest tighten as anxiety overwhelmed me. I closed my eyes tight and felt tears roll down my cheeks. I suppose that was when it dawned on me. The night was to be my last as a human being. I don't remember falling asleep that night. When morning came, Thomas and I found ourselves lying atop a sand dune. Upon awakening, we looked down over a collection of sandstone ruins, the sun slowly rising behind us. The stranger, camels, nor the campsite were anywhere to be seen. I accepted in that moment. Our only option was to continue forward, no matter what that meant for my colleague and I. Thomas and I were both loners in our daily lives. No wives, children, or any real friends. I can't speak for my colleague, but this fact didn't bother me much. I had given up on genuine human connection a long time ago. I found life easier to manage when I was the only one I had to worry about. I do realize, however, that my lack of real human connection has made me rather indifferent to the world around me. I found that I lost touch with my emotions a long time ago. However, I am able to think logically rather than emotionally, which has presented itself as a benefit to me. I have come to realize that in order to validate my existence, I must achieve something that I otherwise wouldn't if I spent time with others, desperately trying to convince myself that I had a good life 
by chasing temporary feelings of joy. All these other people must soon realize that to live a normal life is to have never truly existed. Who will remember these people? Their children. Once their children become adults and have children of their own, all that their lives will have amounted to is becoming a part of a cycle. A cycle in which eventually the people involved will no longer matter. Perhaps being forgotten isn't such an awful idea to many, but in my mind, why should I have ever existed in the first place if it amounted to nothing? However, this idea stems from my false belief that my life is supposed to have meaning, which of course it doesn't. I suppose everyone thinks that their life is supposed to be meaningful as a result of seeing the world through their own eyes. We all live day to day, forever amongst our own thoughts. This must give each of us our own sense of self-importance. The inability to see anyone else as quite as important as ourselves must also be why the majority of people are partly narcissistic. Everyone has an element of cruelty within them after all. Golden sand stretched out to the horizon in every direction. Towering sand dunes surrounded us, almost resembling waves frozen in time. They shimmered in the sunlight. And if it wasn't for the rising temperature, I may have stayed a little longer to admire Earth's beauty. Sights like that have always helped me clear my mind. I've never been an optimistic man, however. I have always felt that despite the bleakness of life, no one can take the feeling of watching the sunrise from you. The feeling I had in that moment reminded me why I was still alive. Thomas and I made our way down to the ruins of what was clearly once a village or town of some sort. The site was walled in by the surrounding dunes. Once amongst the ruins, the sun was only barely visible. The shadows created by the dunes provided much needed relief from the heat. However, the atmosphere down there was utterly alien. I've never felt so unwelcome. It was as if the air in the place was poison. The majority of these ruins were collections of sandstone foundations and scattered rocks. The buildings themselves had clearly collapsed long ago. From what I could tell, the site was once perhaps a collection of houses for a small, ancient community. A community of which my colleague and I weren't the first to discover. However, the place was empty, silent. I at least expected to meet an archaeologist team or see at least some sign of a team or their equipment, but the place was completely barren. Thomas spotted an opening in one of the sand dunes. Darkness flowed out of the opening like smoke, beckoning us towards it. I felt myself take steps towards it, however, I don't recall that being my intention. My body started moving of its own accord, and my mind was left trapped inside, watching as I moved toward the dark, unable to command my own movements. Above the opening were those unusual symbols from my letter that I had grown so familiar with. The symbols were etched into a sandstone archway that kept the sand above from swallowing the opening. As Thomas and I grew closer, the opening seemingly grew larger, the sandstone cracking as it grew, allowing small amounts of sand to slip between the cracks. The symbols seemed to resemble drawings rather than any form of ancient written language. Seeing them in person, they almost looked like depictions of monsters, the type only a diseased mind could conceive. As panic set in, I tried to scream. I wanted to shout for Thomas to pull me away, but I couldn't speak. I couldn't make a sound. My mind was racing as my body continued forward. My eyes were locked into the darkness and I couldn't look away. My body was no longer mine. I was trapped, only able to spectate as I marched in, the dark wrapping itself around me until eventually I couldn't see anything at all. Part 3. The Gift In the darkness I found myself unable to see or feel anything. Even my sense of smell had abandoned me. I had unwillingly walked into complete sensory deprivation. I was utterly alone with only my thoughts, which was perhaps the most terrifying state to be in. 
Unless I counted the seconds, I had no sense of passing time. It felt as if I was floating. I felt weightless, powerless, completely alone. Initially, I had thought that counting the seconds would help calm me down, keep my sanity intact. However, after 1,000 seconds, I gave up. In the dark, I began to contemplate my predicament. Perhaps I'd be stuck here forever. Is this what death feels like? If I was dead, surely I'd be unable to think. Surely my sense of being would disappear and I'd cease to be entirely. Unless I was wrong about the existence of a soul. Perhaps my body was crushed in the cave and my mind had now been set free into the void, forever to be left to myself. For a moment, I thought perhaps heaven and hell do exist and for my lack of faith, I was turned away from both, to be left in the dark for all eternity. I find it funny how even the most atheistic minds look for some divine assistance when in a state of complete hopelessness. I suppose we like to believe that someone, something, has to be responsible. To admit that life is entirely led by one's own decisions is to recognize that when all is hopeless, it is entirely left to oneself to find a way out of the dark. In the void, I eventually began to feel the warmth travel up throughout my body. I first noticed a tingling in my feet which slowly crept up inside me. The way it passed through me was not altogether unpleasant. I remember looking down at my hands after the feeling had passed my shoulders, only to be able to see them. My body had reappeared and was strangely unshadowed by the surrounding darkness. I touched my face, rubbed the stubble on my cheeks, and almost began to cry. The fact that my sense of touch had begun to return felt like a small act of mercy. Without warning, I felt the ground beneath me give way. I felt my stomach drop as the unquestionable sensation of falling overcame me. I began tumbling through the air, unable to determine which way was up. Breathing became harder and harder until eventually I couldn't breathe at all. I continued spinning and tumbling faster and faster, my limbs flailing as I gasped for air. I could hear the low groan of a monster in the dark and closed my eyes tight. The groans sounded as if they were coming from inside my head, from inside my thoughts. Moments later, I must have fainted. Thankfully, darkness yet again swallowed me whole. When I woke, I appeared to be floating. I could see my body as if I was standing in broad daylight. However, my entire surroundings were still in darkness. I could not even see the floor beneath me. My senses had remained intact. When I bent down to touch the surface I found myself on, my hands fell beneath my feet. I swiped my hand around, felt the bottom of my shoes just to be sure. I was indeed suspended in the air. I could not tell how high I was as pitch darkness still surrounded me. After a moment, I noticed a shape in the dark. The shape convulsed violently. Tendrils or tentacles, perhaps, grew out from it as it writhed. I could not make out its form, however, it seemed to emit its own light naturally. As what I can only assume were its limbs grew closer towards me, I could see a faint glow oozing through the grey, slimy skin. Groans came again. I could feel the unearthly noise vibrate through my head. Covering my ears only amplified the sound. This creature seemingly communicated telepathically in a language that was beyond human comprehension. I fell to my knees as pain shot through my mind with every noise it uttered, begging it to stop speaking. As I knelt, I felt the wet slime of its skin touch my face. I dared not open my eyes in fear of what may happen to my mind had I not gone mad already. The slime then began pushing its way between my lips. I held my mouth closed and covered my mouth tightly with both hands. The slime worked its way between my fingers and through my lips. I tried to crawl back as fast as I could manage, but I found my body again not responding to my demands. My eyes remained closed as my hands fell to my sides, not of my own volition. I was only in control of my mind, 
in which the creature had clearly gained access to as well. I felt as parts of its body oozed down my throat, ears up my nose, and down the tear ducts in my eyes. My insides burned as it worked its way down my body. I couldn't breathe at all. The panic and pain I felt in that moment I would not wish upon my worst enemy. Eventually, the pain began to subside. It no longer hurt, and I remember thinking that this is how I die. I have never been particularly afraid of death. Even when faced with it, I felt happy in a way. Happy to be at peace and drift away from this world. My body went limp, and I could see a light that grew closer. That moment was the most at peace I have ever felt. I next found myself in a state of complete non-existence. I'm not entirely sure how to describe the experience, or rather, lack of experience. I am aware of what happened entirely through hindsight. However, in the moment, I didn't even have a sense of self. I suppose what I experienced was, for lack of a better word, was pure nothingness. I truly ceased to exist. I was dead. The creature blessed me with the knowledge of what death really is. It's nothing. No matter what you believe, when death comes, we will each be thrown into non-existence, never to so much as even think again. I wonder if that knowledge will reinforce some people's nihilistic views of life, or if knowing that this is single life we all possess will give some people a newfound appreciation for the time they have. For me, this knowledge didn't matter much anymore. With the blessing of this being who occupied my body, I was able to comprehend the previously incomprehensible. I don't know how long I have been removed from existence. Obviously, time is no longer a concept when you don't exist to feel its passing. Reflecting on this moment sends pain through my head, like someone hitting the inside of my forehead with a hammer. It's knowledge no man should have. The momentary death I experience should be a blank spot in my mind, much like when you fall asleep and fail to dream. When I came to, I began to notice balls of light appearing in the darkness around me. I felt a chill shoot through me, as if I had just been thrown under the ice of a frozen lake. It took me a moment, but I soon realized that I was surrounded by stars. Behind me was the sun. It was unquestionably the sun. I was suspended in outer space. This moment is when I truly questioned my reality, truly questioned if I could trust my own mind anymore. I felt my lungs move as the creature breathed on my behalf. The skin on my body also now appeared to be the same grey slime of the creature's, with a faint glow from the thing I could now understand. My attention was directed to Earth. It was truly beautiful to see our planet like this, from this distance. Time appeared to be accelerated. I watched Earth slowly turn. I spotted England as it emerged from the dark side of the planet and drifted into the illumination of the sun. Seeing the planet like this is one of the greatest blessings that has ever been bestowed unto me. However, the experience does invoke a sense of utter worthlessness. Life and all our individual problems are all so meaningless. I could see everyone from up here, and not one person actually mattered. As time continued to accelerate and the Earth continued to spin, I watched as human life evolved, as technological advancements grew far beyond the boundaries of what I had ever imagined to be possible. I watched as vessels left Earth, as buildings appeared on the moon, shortly followed by buildings on Mars, too. Humanity continued to spread out in advance, to gain understanding and learn about the universe. For a moment, I was filled with joy. Joy simply to be human, and to be a part of this evolution. Until a great fire. A comet will strike the Earth. Explosives will be fired into it during its descent, but due to its size, our efforts to retaliate won't matter much. I watched as a wall of fire spat out in every direction from the impact zone. For centuries the earth will burn, fire will fill our atmosphere, but the earth will continue to turn. 
After the fire fades, the earth will be a mix of red and brown, uninhabitable to any form of life. The buildings on Mars and the moon will eventually fade and decay. All the work and pain we endured all led up to one random cosmic event, an event that will eradicate any evidence of humanity. Any and all progress we made as a species came to nothing, or rather, will come to nothing. With a jolt, I was pulled backwards. The Earth got smaller and smaller as I continued gaining speed. I watched the Earth until it was a brown dot in the distance, and then until I couldn't see it any longer. I was pulled past many planets, stars, moons, and suns, through many solar systems and galaxies. All empty. Life, as it turns out, even simple life, is an incredibly rare phenomenon. Humanity, at the end of it, as rare and as precious as is, was pointless. Our existence in the universe didn't matter to the universe itself. I can only imagine that life has tried on many planets, many times, only to be destroyed by events out of their control, or in terms of intelligent life, likely destroyed by their own doing. Life and everything that comes from it is the exception to the rule in our universe. The being who allowed me to this understanding, I can only imagine is part of a race who beat the odds, who avoided total annihilation just long enough for the species to take to the stars and save themselves. I now understand that one day not only will my individual existence be forgotten, but we all will. Any trace of human existence will eventually be wiped away. I woke on the sand. My mouth felt dry and my body weak. I can't say for sure how long I had been away from my body. Sitting up required immense effort, and my muscles burnt as I strained to sit upright in the sand. As I looked around, I noticed that I was lying just outside the opening that had previously pulled me in. However, the opening had collapsed and was now completely covered by sand. The archway was no longer visible. I looked around to find even the ruins had seemingly disappeared. However, the imprints where structures once stood remained in the sand, confirming to me I was still sane and that the experience was real. I looked up at the towering sand dunes around me and watched as the wind blew small dust clouds down into the pit I found myself in. Thomas's body lay not too far from me. I struggled to focus on him, but as my vision cleared, I noticed that he too was awake. He lay on his back, eyes bloodshot and wide as he fixated on the midday sun above. I couldn't call to him. I tried, but my throat only managed a hoarse growl. He looked at me. If only for a second, in that second, I saw more pain in his eyes than I'd ever seen in any man before or since. I understood why, however, and watched as he returned his attention to the sun. Part 4 Enlightenment Reflecting on our return to England feels like trying to recall a dream. A dream that you're sure took place, however, the details of which are hard to recall. The trip took weeks, of course. After waking in the dunes, Thomas and I yet again began walking, not of our own volition. We walked for days through the desert, and though we could speak, we chose not to. Our bodies were sent back to Alexandria, after which we again boarded the HMS Hannibal and began our journey home. Not one word was uttered between Thomas and I during this time, nor since returning to Dartmouth. Thomas, in the following weeks after our return, I later discovered had committed suicide. I cannot blame him for his decision, given what he and I know, nor am I surprised by his actions, as I always knew he was a little weak-minded. I personally discovered Thomas's body. After roughly two weeks, I noticed his absence from the university. I was hoping to discuss matters with him, so visited his home in the country one night. He lived in a damp and overgrown little cottage, isolated deep within the English countryside. As I approached, I found the door to be wide open. No light escaped his home, however. 
I spotted the silhouette of his lower half dangling, limp through the doorway. He had hanged himself in the front room. Not the most pleasant way to go, by all accounts. In his bulging eyes, I saw an expression of undoubtable liberation. I pushed his corpse aside with one hand and walked past to investigate his desk, letting him swing a little behind me. He hadn't left a note. I assume he knew I'd be the one to find him. He knew I'd understand his decision. It was all too much for his mind to take. Confirmation of the soul being an idea of fiction finally gave him the assurance he needed to depart without fear of the afterlife. I left him there after discovering his fate. His death didn't matter much to me. I felt no need to give him a proper burial. The authorities will see to that upon discovering his body. Thomas now no longer exists, having left no impact on this world, nor the others he shared it with. Pitiful existence, really. Since returning to work, I have been utilizing my position at the university and the resources at my disposal to look into any rumors of particular hieroglyphs. I have been researching any ancient language or symbols that appear to be utterly unique, and so far I have found no further signs of these creatures. Within the archaeology community, I have been deemed a joke for suggesting the existence of these alien languages. Naturally, I have not disclosed the reasoning behind my research as to keep at least part of my reputation intact. The original site of my encounter has since disappeared. I have no doubt that the beings I encountered are otherworldly. Most likely, from the reaches of the cosmos, humans will never hope to fathom. They appear to live on an entirely different plane of existence to us, one in which time is a construct they can move freely within. I intend to meet them again. There's so much more I can learn from them, so much more they can show me. With their power, their knowledge of the universe, they can help us, save us from our fate. I suspect now that the man who guided Thomas and I to that place was one of those creatures, or at the very least was himself guided by one of them. I suspect that from the moment I received the letter, that thing led my decisions, my movements. I often wonder how much of my free will was stripped from me, without me ever realizing. I do realize, however, that I brought this upon myself. All those sleepless nights praying for answers. Something in the dark heard me. Something in the dark answered me. I wonder if they still hear me. Even now. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.